Hey everyone, welcome back to my channel and if you are new here, I am Mariana and I interview the brightest minds of physical therapy. So if you want to increase your knowledge, start right now by subscribing to this channel, clicking on the bell so you don't miss anything and give us a thumbs up and share with our friends. Today, our guest is Nehama Karman and she is a board certified pediatric physical therapist and she's going to talk about the challenges faced in the PEDS world. I hope you enjoyed the show. Hi, Nehama. Welcome to PT Pro Talk. How are you today? I'm doing well. Thank you, Mariana. Thank you for accepting my invitation. And I'm excited to talk about PEDS today. It's my pleasure. I can talk about PEDS for days. <laughs> Great. So let's jump right in. So could you tell us a little bit about yourself, your, your career, and how did you get to where you are right now? Sure. Um, so I went to physical therapy school in the early 1990s, and um, at the time, I received a scholarship that paid my tuition to PT school from the New York City public school system. And the requirement of the scholarship was that I would work for the New York City public schools as a physical therapist for two years after I graduated from PT school. So the positive side of that was that I had a guaranteed job upon graduation. Um, but there is a reason that they were giving those scholarships. The reason they gave those service scholarships was because they had a hard time uh, finding physical therapists and occupational therapists to work in the New York City public schools. So they had to um, offer an enticement to have people take that job. And, you know, there were several reasons. Um, at the time, physical therapy was a very high demand um, position where there were a lot of jobs for physical therapists. It was a very largely growing field. And so there were, you know, you when you came out of school, you had a lot of choices as to where to work. And the New York City school system was, um, shall we say, not the highest paying um, position, but also because they had a shortage of therapists in the system, when you graduated, you did not receive the mentorship that was common at the time. You know, in the early 90s, when you graduated from school as a physical therapist, it was expected that your first job would probably be in a hospital setting where you had a mentor or a supervising therapist who would really help you through the first few years of your career and help you to develop as a clinician. But if you worked in the New York City schools, it was it was very likely that you might be the only therapist in that school, the only physical therapist. And there was one supervisor for all five boroughs of New York City. So that supervisor might come to your school once or twice a year to help you out. So, you know, you were sort of thrown into the deep end of the pool and you had to sink or swim in your first job. So as a new clinician without... Um, without a supervisor on site or without a mentor on site, it was it was kind of hard. And remember, these were the days before you had, you know, open access to the internet where you could have easy uh, document retrieval of many different research articles. Uh, Evidence-based practice wasn't even a common term that we had at the time because the research in physical therapy was really only just beginning. And so it was hard to figure out how to be a physical therapist. And, you know, in school, they teach you some, but it was expected that you would actually learn how to do the job on the job. So as a new clinician, I had to seek mentorship elsewhere, outside of my primary job. And initially what I did was I took another job. I took a job in the afternoons after work at a local private physical therapy practice that treated children and adults so that I would be working with other more experienced clinicians that would spend some time mentoring me and, and helping me learn uh, how to be a better therapist. And so that was sort of my early career development for the first two years. I, I worked two jobs to learn how to do my job. And then as soon as my commitment to the New York City schools was up, I went and took a job that would give me the mentorship that I wanted. 
And that was in a children's hospital, um, not far from where I live. And there, there were experienced clinicians who would mentor you, but there were also people outside of your discipline that would mentor you. So when I started working at the children's hospital, my closest mentor and my ultimately my research partner was actually the neuropsychologist in the facility. And he was the person that I worked most closely with, which is unusual for someone whose specialty is motor behavior, myself, that my research partner was somebody whose specialty was cognition. But when I started to work at the children's hospital, I found my true love, which was traumatic brain injury. I just loved working with Uh, at the time it was children with traumatic brain injuries. And that was my favorite, favorite population to work with. Of course, I worked with everyone who was assigned to my caseload in the hospital. So I worked with many different diagnoses, but you know, the TBI unit was my favorite place to be. And so having a research partner whose expertise was cognition, especially in acquired brain injuries uh, was a really good uh, matchup for me. And at the same time, I went back to school in the evenings and on weekends um, and got an advanced degree in orthopedic physical therapy. And so having started out in pediatrics, I felt like one of my deficiencies was in my orthopedics background, my knowledge of orthopedics. So I went back to school to strengthen my orthopedic background and found that I was very easily able to um, intertwine the two areas. So I, I would use my knowledge of orthopedics to enhance my treatment of people with neurological conditions, whether it was children with acquired brain injuries or whether it was children with cerebral palsy, which is a brain injury that you're born with. And I actually worked in the children's hospital in different capacities for about 10 years. So I started out as a a staff therapist and then I was a senior therapist and then a clinical educator and then a researcher within that facility. And so having worn different hats over the years, I sort of developed different uh, areas of of expertise. And my final uh, role there was as a researcher, researching treatment in children with traumatic brain injuries or with acquired brain injuries. And then, you know, there came a time where it was clear that it was time for me to move on. And so I transitioned to working with some adults with traumatic brain injuries as well. Again, sort of marrying my orthopedic background and my neurological background, sort of developing some new um, focus in my interventions. And along that, along that process, I continued to take courses and develop my expertise and seek out mentors in every area of practice where I needed help. So I really worked hard to to find people that would be my go-to if I had a question about um, bracing, I would go to one clinician. If I had a question about cognition, I would go to a different clinician. If I had a question about gait, I would go to a different clinician. So I I sort of found different people that were my go-to and again, with the growth of accessibility of information with the internet, it became much easier to begin to research different different techniques or different areas of practice, effectiveness of different approaches to therapy. And so I, I grew up as a clinician in exciting times where the research was growing and our access to the research was also growing. And I loved research. So I started some coursework that was on the path to a PhD, never finished my PhD. I didn't actually do the research and complete my dissertation. I'm one of those. Um, But at the time that I was working on that, I also held faculty positions at a couple of universities in the New York area in their physical therapy programs. And I love the teaching as well, which is what brought me to my current position, which is as a clinical educator for mobility research who are manufacturers of rehab equipment that I've been using since the 1990s in my treatment of adults and children with neurological conditions. So I'm now the chief clinical educator for mobility research who manufacture the light gate and other rehab equipment. And I integrate that into my clinical practice and into my teaching practice as well. 
Nice. That's a, a lot, a lot of information, your background. And um, I think it's exciting uh, just to hear about your progression and evolution in the area and especially in PEDS that I think it's not very common. So I'm curious to know, what do you think are the most common challenges facing PEDS? Uh, there are a few of them. Um, I think the, the first one is that when you're treating a young child, uh, particularly a child who had an injury at birth or shortly after birth, they may not have had the same movement experiences and learning process that somebody who had an injury later in life has. So if you're treating a young child with, um, with a genetic condition or with an intrauterine or a, a birth trauma related injury or an injury that's acquired shortly after birth, they don't go through normal development. They don't go through the normal learning process, creating the motor programs that we all rely on. So if you're working with an adult who had a stroke, chances are they walked prior to their stroke. But if you're working with a child with cerebral palsy, chances are they didn't walk prior to them receiving physical therapy. So they don't have a motor program or a motor memory to rely on. Additionally, children are born with a skeletal system that's very different from the adult skeletal system. Their bones are shaped differently. Like their, their bones are very bowed. They almost look like, like a koala bear, like they're built to hug a tree and in the shapes of their limbs and their, their bones change shape through the process of normal development, through weight bearing and muscle pull that typically developing children go through. So their bones straighten out and they um, they twist or derotate from the position that they are in intrauterine over the first few years of life. But if a child is not crawling and walking and pulling to stand and doing all of those things that typically developing children do when they're learning how to walk, their, the shape that the bones achieve is different. They also don't lay down as much bone if they're not going through those normal forces because the signal to lay down bone, this is Wolf's law, bones form according to the forces that are applied to them, both in terms of their shape, but also in terms of their density. So premature osteopenia or osteoporosis is very common in children who are not typically developing because they haven't gone through that normal process of development. So their bony alignment may be different due to the forces that were applied. And as a result, their direction of muscle pull will be different. Their joint alignments will be different, which sets them up for other musculoskeletal dysfunction and pain disorders as they, as they grow and mature. So they haven't gone through the normal learning process and they haven't gone through the normal physical process, which sets them up at a deficit. They're starting, you know, they're starting the race, not on the starting block, but, you know, back on the bench and they have to get from the bench to the starting block and then run the race. So it's a very different approach when somebody doesn't have that memory to rely on. And then the other big challenge is in pediatrics is who is your client? And that's, that's a big challenge because your patient that you're treating is the child, but they're not necessarily the decision maker. Although we want to give children some degree of agency or autonomy over themselves and over their own bodies, um, children don't always get to make all of their own choices because they don't know what's best for them. And because they don't have complete autonomy, they have responsible parents. So the whole family becomes your client in a way, and you're answering to the parent, but also trying to make sure that the child receives everything that they need. And then just like in the adult world, you have third-party payers that you answer to that would um, determine uh, how many visits you get of physical therapy that will be reimbursed. In the pediatric world, sometimes your third party payer is an insurance company, but sometimes your third party payer is a school system or an educational system. And in that case, there's the added complexity that 
everything that you're working on in physical therapy has to be educationally driven to allow that child access to their educational environment. So the child is your patient, but your client is the school system and your goals have to be educationally related. And so there's this sort of conflict in determining what your priorities might be with any individual. And then the final challenge in working in pediatrics is that you are treating the child, but you always need to keep in mind the adult that that child is going to become. So everything that you're doing now has to be designed to set them up for success in the long run. And that long run can be 80 years of future if they have, you know, a typical lifespan. Um, So there's this complexity of, I see you now, and I need to give you the skills that you need right now, but I also need to protect your joints and your musculoskeletal system for the future. And sometimes those aberrant movements that you're performing right now are making you successful at accomplishing a task, but they may set you up for injury or pain down the road or for more dysfunction down the road. And so you have to sort of walk this balancing act between what's functional and what's efficient and what's uh, safe, not just in the short term, but also in the long term. So you have a lot of things that you need to keep in mind that are somewhat different than what you're doing when you're working with adults. So now that you just mentioned about insurance, I was, I'm curious um, because they, like in orthopedic physical therapy, they limit the number of visits. So how, how does it work with PEDS? Because you know that it's 10, 20 sessions are probably not going to be enough. He's going to need like long-term treatment and um, all of that. So how does it work? It's really interesting. And I, I think that the Affordable Care Act has had a positive influence on that. Um, in the pediatric world, because what was happening in pediatrics a lot is that a lot of the children that you work with have really um, large scale medical conditions at birth. And so before the Affordable Care Act uh, became law, insurance companies would set lifetime caps on expenditures. And some of these children were reaching those caps in the first or second year of their life, which then made them uninsurable, which think about it. They've used up everything they had in their first year just to keep them alive. And then there's nothing left. So I think that the Affordable Care Act, by eliminating lifetime caps um, and eliminating the pre-existing conditions as a as a mechanism of eliminating these high-risk individuals from the insurance pool, uh, has had a positive effect in pediatrics. But we still have annual caps in expenditures and in number of visits that are allowed for intervention, for rehab interventions like physical therapy. And, um, you know, one of the big challenges is how do you allot those visits over a year, for example, or over the lifespan of a condition? So you may not have a lifetime cap on physical therapy or on expenditures, but you might have a lifetime amount of visits of physical therapy for a particular condition. So if that child has a genetic condition that might, they, and they have 30 visits per condition, that 30 visits, their genetic condition is not gonna change anytime soon. We don't have the medical technology for that. So then what? And then there's also the, the consideration that a lot of medical conditions that used to be um, uh, terminal, not immediately, but maybe prior to reaching adulthood, like some of the muscular dystrophies or cystic fibrosis are now no longer such. So now we need to consider that these children are going to become adults. Whereas in the past, we didn't need to consider that they were going to become adults because they weren't going to live that long. And so we need to ration the care still, despite that lack of lifetime cap, sometimes annually or sometimes over a lifetime of a particular condition. So there are a couple of ways that you deal with that. First of all, um, there's the diagnosis itself. The physical therapy diagnosis doesn't have to be the medical diagnosis. So a physical therapy diagnosis might 
not be the genetic condition or the medical condition, but it might be the specific problem that brought that person to physical therapy right now. So it might be a gait problem or it might be a pain problem, which might be different during the next episode of care. But then there's still that idea of how to very consciously uh, schedule your year's worth of benefits. And so some clinicians will provide um, a very infrequent schedule of physical therapy over the course of a year. So maybe two visits a month for a year, or sometimes they'll provide a brief intense episode of care, maybe daily for three weeks, and then um, a much less frequent schedule of therapy visits for later in the year. So a lot of physical therapists will see, um, you know, maybe in January, January or February, these booster um, episodes of care after the new calendar year begins or the new insurance year begins, and then save some visits for later. Um, and then there's also the multiple revenue streams. So some children will receive physical therapy in school through the school year, and that's different from what's covered by your insurance company. And then they may go to outpatient therapies for goals that are not educationally related, so or for medically based um, or functional training based physical therapy. So there's a lot of different ways you need to look at the system. And the truth is it's really hard on a physical therapist to keep all of that in mind and, and do what's best for their patients. You know, when, when I became a physical therapist, nobody taught me about the business of physical therapy. As a matter of fact, one of my professors who taught the professional behaviors course in my first year of PT school, who eventually became the um, president of my state chapter of American Physical Therapy Association, said in the most sarcastic voice, chiropractic students take business courses in chiropractic school, like, like they dirtied their hands somehow by knowing what they needed to know in order to keep their doors open. And truthfully, it's becoming harder and harder for physical therapists to keep their doors open. Reimbursement rates are decreasing. And especially in pediatrics, it's very hard to see more than one patient at a time. You know, in an orthopedic practice, you might schedule four patients in an hour and each one gets 15 minutes of individual attention. And then you're sort of keeping your eye on them from across the room while they're performing an exercise and providing correction while you're with a different patient on the table right there in a big open gym. That doesn't tend to work very well, especially with young children. So, you know, with low reimbursement rates per session or, or caps per visit in the number of, of codes that you can bill and the like, you know, I, I feel like therapists who graduated when I did really don't have the business background to be able to do that in pediatrics. Like, we need to take additional coursework in order to keep that going because there's no way I could see four patients in an hour. Two is a big number for me. And so that's a big challenge. One of the ways I, I think that we tend to meet that is with strong home programs, but that relies not on the patient themselves to perform the home program in many cases, but their family members, their caregivers to do so. And, you know, now during COVID times where a lot of parents are also supervising their children who are uh, telecommuting to school, um, who are participating in remote education while the parents telecommute to work, they realize how, how hard it is, even with their typically developing children, to be implementing these things on top of all of their other responsibilities. And now think about a child with an impairment I, I don't know how they do it. So I try and keep home programs limited. I try and work very closely with families in terms of asking them, what's reasonable for you? And then, you know, how many minutes a day do you have? And then structuring a program that fits within that. And then giving them very specific guidelines as to what should be an alert that they need to make an appointment to come in. So if you're giving a child a boost, you know, an intense episode of care and saving a few visits for later, so maybe two or three weeks of intense PT to gain a skill and then sending them off 
to incorporate that skill, sort of like people on sports teams, right? During the preseason is when they develop their skills. They do their drills and they have their workouts and they have their scrimmages. And then during the season, they play the game. Maybe they have a couple of practices, but it's not like what they do in preseason. But then if something happens during the season, they might go for treatment or for some sort of intervention to get them back on the field. So if you use the same idea for physical therapy, maybe you'll get your boost, your your intense episode of care as your preseason early in the year. But then knowing that children's bodies are constantly changing, parents need to know what, what should make me call you or schedule an appointment. And so I tell them any sort of growth spurt. And parents know when their children have grown, all of a sudden they turn around and their pants are too short, right? When that happens and it happens overnight, that's when you need to call me or come in to see me so I can check that child out and let you know how to alter their program. Or maybe they need a few extra visits because bones grow faster than muscle. And so they're likely to get tight when they have that growth spurt or something like that. So I give them very concrete things. Any deterioration of their performance in a task, right? Come back and see me. And sometimes it really helps when you end that brief episode of care, when you finish your three weeks, schedule your follow-up visit in a month or six weeks or three months. It helps parents to have that appointment on the calendar. I'm happy if you cancel. If you don't need me, you can call me up a week before and say, you know what? Nah, I'm good. I'm going to give up that slot. But knowing that they have that on their calendar is really helpful to to keep things on their radar and so that they don't get lost to follow up. Yeah, there are so many variables that you have to keep up with that I think it's way more challenge dealing with that than like orthopedics that we still have problem with insurance and reimbursement. But it, as you said, we still can see a lot of uh, patients at the same time. So you can really scale your practice because you need pretty much that one-on-one. So I imagine how challenge is. And uh, especially like on the insurance part. So I'm curious just to see, I have a question about prognosis. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so what do you expect to see like the functional progress. I know that that's very broad and varies a lot, but I'm more uh, curious asking about the, because like in orthopedics, physical therapy, for example, you have the reward of seeing the person being like pain-free and that's different in PEDS. So how do you like keep going and keep motivating and like what progress do you expect? And also, um, in the insurance world, because we have to be proving that they are progressing to get more visits. I don't know if impedes is different or not. So just about like all these uh, aspects of the prognosis part that I'm curious. It's actually a great question. And, and my answer is gonna be longer than the sort of snarky statement that I'm gonna give you now. As far as insurance companies or third-party payers are concerned, your treatment is only as good as your outcome measures. If your outcome measures are not sensitive to the change that you're hoping to make, you're not going to detect the changes that you're making. And some of the um, outcomes measures or assessment tools that we have are not sensitive enough to the pace of change that we're look that we're likely to drive. So a lot of the measures that we use in pediatrics are not even supposed to be um, uh, carried out, I'm having a little bit of a word finding problem. You're not even supposed to implement them more than once or twice a year, some of the scales that we use. And if you think about your adult outcome measures, you can do a Berg balance scale twice a week if you wanted to, because there's not that learning effect of the test. In pediatrics, that's not necessarily the case. So one of the things that we need to, to focus on is what measures are you using to identify the change. And when you're implementing a measure, you wanna measure things like how often, how long, or how much. So for an endurance measure, you might say, how long can the person walk bef before they need to stop and rest? Or you know, in the adult world, it would be how many minutes do you walk before the claudication pain starts or something like that. So you have to answer questions like that. But in pediatrics, sometimes those changes are slow to come and they're very small. So 
you know, meeting that minimally clinically important difference or minimal detectable change might actually be harder. It might take a longer period of time. So we need really sensitive measures and we need measures that we can implement in a heartbeat. And a lot of the tools that we use in, in pediatrics are not like that. So if you're working in a school setting, it's easy because your assessments, you do these quarterly or triennial evaluations, and then you do a big annual reassessment. So once a year, you can implement those measures, and hopefully your measures um, are sensitive to the changes that you're driving, that over a year you're going to see a change. Um, but having a sensitive measure is really important. And one of my favorite measures, actually, is one that's um, been developed by mobility research, and that is the gait sense, which is an instrumented treadmill that performs computerized gait analysis of spatiotemporal gait measures in real time while the person is walking on the treadmill. So something that you might not be able to measure with your eyes. And, you know, when I was in PT school, we learned to roll out butcher paper down the hallway and put marks on the person's heels and have them walk on that path and then pull out measuring tapes and measure their spatiotemporal gait parameters. None of us have time to do that in clinical practice. But if your treatment is taking place on the treadmill, you can turn on the gait sense for the first minute and the last minute that that person has walked and see what's changed. Or at the beginning of the week and the end of the week or beginning of the month and end of the month and see those small changes in gait spatiotemporal parameters or symmetry measures that will tell you that change has actually taken place. So I really like to use something like the gait sense that's taking those measures without taking extra time and gives me a summative report that really immediately the changes become visually apparent where you can overlay one report over another and see what has changed. The other thing I think we need to focus on in pediatrics in terms of measuring change is that it, it actually comes from the adult arena. In Medicare, the Jim O.V. Sebelius uh, ruling says that preventing decline is a valid enough reason to provide physical therapy to an adult. It's a Medicare ruling, so Medicare typically treats uh, reimburses for treatment of adults over 65 or um, people with uh, disabilities, people with impairments. Um, and improvement is not the standard for providing care. Preventing or slowing decline is the standard. And I think we need to take that same stand in pediatrics as well. If my treat, if the person is expected to decline with, with over time and they're not declining or that decline is slower, that's enough of a reason for the treatment to be reimbursable. The problem is that in pediatrics, it's very rare that Medicare is providing that reimbursement. Typically, it's uh, private health insurance or Medicaid or a school system. So those have to come on board and follow those same standards, but with a for-profit third-party payer like, um, like private insurance, you know, they're in the business of making money. So I don't know how soon that will happen, but private insurance companies for the most part do follow Medicare guidelines for reimbursement of services. So we can hold out some hope. Yeah, and I think as a physical therapist, it's always important to keep that in mind too, because I work with peds just while I was doing my, my rotations in college. And I think it was a little like frustrating because you expect to see something. But as you said, if you're not declining, if you're supposed to decline, that should be good enough. I just think that's a, I think that's a personal challenge. I don't know. People that are in PITs probably uh, love it and are motivated enough. But I think a lot of PTs like myself, I believe, I think it's hard because you want to see the improvement. So you do. We all need that dopamine hit that we get when our patients get better. We need those positive experiences to keep us engaged and motivated at work. Um, I think in pediatrics, we use a longer timeline. So we're better at waiting longer between those dopamine hits of progress. But I also think that, um, you know, that's why I love traumatic brain injury or acquired brain injuries, because sometimes you get those dopamine hits more regularly because it's a more recent injury. Although I, I, I love the long-term chronic um, acquired brain injury population as well. Um, and we also get our dopamine hits, not just from patient progress, but just from 
you know, the fun of what we're doing. You know, you have to incorporate play into what you're doing in pediatrics and kids will make you laugh. They're, they are really funny. So we can get our dopamine hits in other ways other than just patient progress. But I think we're also better at waiting for that uh, gratification. And chocolate. Yeah. Chocolate. <laughs> yeah, makes sense. Um, and just one more question. Let's talk briefly about cerebral palsy that I believe it's uh, the most common condition that you see. Um So what approach do you usually usually use that is something specific on the treatment in particular that you want to like talk about or mention? Mm -hmm. So cerebral palsy is a brain injury, but it's a brain injury that's acquired um, close to birth. So either intrauterine or perinatal or within the first two years of life. And the reason we don't name it brain injury is because the presentation is different for the reasons that I mentioned earlier when I spoke about how children are different from adults. And, but it is a neurological condition. It's a non-progressive lesion in the brain, just like a stroke is a non-progressive lesion in the brain. There's a bleed or an anoxic episode that causes damage to the, to the brain itself. The lesion doesn't change in the brain, but the effects of it can be progressive. And in cerebral palsy, it is primarily a disorder of movement and postural control. So just like in a stroke, Strokes are usually in one hemisphere and that side of the body, the, the opposite side of the body from the lesion is impaired. In cerebral palsy, the lesion can be unilateral or bilateral, but the presentations are to some extent predictable, just like in stroke. Every stroke is different, but there are commonalities between them. And the same is true in cerebral palsy. So we tend to see things like spasticity and poor motor control and poor postural alignment. And that's where I tend to use the light gate even more so than I would in adult populations because the light gate as a body weight support system is designed to correct the person's posture while they're in the device. So not only does it create a false free environment so that your hands are free as the clinician to provide whatever assistance and cues you want to provide. So it's really designed to as a treatment environment In aquatic therapy, you can't help the person down at their feet because that's underwater. And without a scuba tank, I couldn't do that. But what body weight support devices do is they sort of create that buoyant, false free environment on land. And the light gate gives you access to the person's body to provide whatever cues you need to. But more than any other body weight support system, the light gate corrects the person's posture. And so, for example, in spastic diplegic cerebral palsy, which is a very common uh, distribution of cerebral palsy, the legs are more impaired than the arms. So lower body is more impaired than upper body. And as a result, what we tend to see is a postural alignment where the shoulders are very far forward relative to the pelvis. So they have a hard time maintaining that postural alignment of shoulders over hips. Well, if your trunk is forward inclined, which we see in adult populations as well, it, everybody in Parkinson's disease has a stooped posture or forward lean in their posture. That's a hallmark of Parkinson's disease and forward head and shoulders is a hallmark of spastic diplegic cerebral palsy. What happens is now the center of mass is very far forward. And if the center of mass is far forward, the biomechanics are going to be different. So in order to stay upright, if your center of mass is very far forward, you need to fire your extensors more to, to not fall, fall over. And it's more likely that your center of mass is going to fall outside of your base of support because your base of support ends at your toes. So if your center of mass is forward, you're, you can kind of spend your life trying to catch up and reestablish a new base of support, but you're fighting this losing battle. And the final impact of that center of mass being too far forward is that your line of gravity is not going to fall relative to your lower extremity joints in a way that creates the normal flexion and extension moments that are part of normal gait. So your gait is going to be affected. And so if I can take the biomechanics and help to normalize them by creating a postural alignment that's upright, I can elicit a more normal, fluid, energy efficient gait or motor pattern than I could if that postural alignment 
is the typical alignment of somebody with cerebral palsy. So by creating a treatment environment with good postural alignment, now I can provide the stimulus to, that I need to, whether it's a moving treadmill surface or a visual or a verbal cue or a tactile cue to get that movement to take place where they're not fighting this sort of losing battle. So if you think about like in horse racing, the handicap of the horse or how much weight you put on that horse depends on how good the horse is. Well, children with cerebral palsy, as I said, they're starting from a lower motor performance status. And it's like we've we've weighed them down by adding more weight. That's not what we do in horse racing. The good horses get more weight and the slower horses carry less weight. But because of the postural alignment, they're fighting that battle with that added weight. And that's really not setting them up for success. So if I can take that weight off and make it more similar to what we do in horse racing, um, where the person, the, the, the competitor who's, who's maybe not as developed or not as good of a racer has carries less weight, that would be a good thing. And correcting the person's posture so that the line of gravity falls relative to the joint axis where it should at the right moment in the gait cycle sets them up for more success. It makes the task easier and they can learn that less effort can accomplish the same task. What we see in children with cerebral palsy is that everything we're asking them to do is a maximum voluntary effort. And that's not sustainable. If you think about your participation in sports, right? If you're doing a sprint and you're running as fast as you possibly can, what's your distance for your dash? 100 meters, 200 meters, right? That's as long as you can keep going at your maximum voluntary effort. As a matter of fact, sprinters, their effort is so high when they're running during short distances, they don't even take a breath in their sprint, because that would detract from their performance. How sustainable is that? 20 seconds, maybe. Now imagine everything that you're doing all day, just staying up against gravity is a maximum voluntary effort. And now I'm supposed to have leftover reserves in my brain to do something else, to look where I'm going, to pay attention in my, in my school classes. It's too much to ask of someone. So what we need to do is we need to set them up for success so that everything they do is not a maximum voluntary effort because maximum effort is not sustainable. So we need to teach them more fluid, efficient ways to perform the task, not only to, to make it sustainable, but to free up their cognitive capacity to be doing something else at the same time. You and I don't think about walking when we walk right? We're talking on the phone and texting and drinking our coffee and window shopping and our feet just keep going. It becomes so automatic. It's reflexive. I want that same level of performance for a child with a motor impairment like cerebral palsy so that their legs can keep going without them looking at their feet, without them thinking about their feet. But we need to give them the practice that allows them to learn that. And that means setting them up for success by correcting their postural alignment and putting them in a safe environment so that they can practice a lot. When typically developing children are learning how to walk, they cover 2,900 meters a day. They walk half the time that they're awake and they literally never stop. They take 9,000 steps a day. But children with cerebral palsy don't have the same opportunity for practice because they can't do it without help. So anything that gives them more practice is a good thing. And so that's where I love that environment of the light gate and the treadmill because it affords more practice. If you think about a typical physical therapy session in an adult who's had a stroke, how many steps do they really take in a session? A hundred? But they've already walked at some point in their life, right? So if you're getting a hundred steps in a 30 minute physical therapy session, or if you're walking for eight minutes out of that 30 minute session, the number of steps that you take in those eight minutes is actually really important. And that environment of the lake on the treadmill affords you more steps. You never need to stop and turn around because you're running out of space. You can find that rhythm that is hard to get over ground. 
you can offload the upper body and make that lower body that's impaired do more of the work. And so by setting them up to get more practice, by making it more energy efficient, you you may not get those 9,000 steps a day, but you're going to get more than the 100 steps that they would be able to receive if they're relying on physical support for, from another person. Typically, developing children learn how to walk when their parents turn their backs. Children with cerebral palsy don't because they don't have enough baseline skill to do that. So we need to put things in place that make them able to practice more. So I think that technology is just a wonderful thing, right? Like really imagine like, a, I don't know, a couple of years ago, I don't know when the, they created that, but. Uh, oh, about 25 years, a little oh more. Oh yeah, than so that's a long time, more than what I thought. But, but, you know, practice doesn't incorporate new technologies immediately either. So, it, you know, it the first, while. I, yeah, it takes a while for it to be adopted as the gold standard, but I will say most pediatric um, clinicians would benefit from using it. I, I, I can't work without it to tell you the truth. I don't have enough hands, you know, pediatric clinicians were so inappropriate. We really are like in the adult world, you know, when, when I was in PT school, we were told to always position and drape your patient for comfort and modesty. And, you know, when you're working with an adult, you don't mush your body up against them. because that would be, you know, not appropriate. But in pediatrics, we wrap our arms and legs around our patients and we stick our head in their back and, and we get so close. The problem with getting so close is you can't actually see what the person is doing. Being able to take a step back and put your hands on their body and feel what strategies they're using becomes so helpful. So technology is a wonderful thing, and but we need to incorporate it for it to be helpful. Yeah. Yeah. And I just imagine how much better you can do using that, like how more, more efficient and more the use of the time. So I think that's wonderful. Yeah. My uh, first introduction to the light gate was in the mid 90s. And I was working on the traumatic brain injury unit. And, you know, when I went into pediatrics thinking, oh, my kids were going to be smaller than me, but I'm five foot one. And my traumatic brain injury unit patients were teenagers and they towered over me. And there was no way that I could safely work with them without the light gate. So I was very fortunate. I was introduced to it. The hospital purchased it pretty quickly. They, they received a grant to pay for it. And I never looked back. I literally never looked back because it freed me up to do my job better. It was a tool that allowed me to be a better clinician. So my patients had better outcomes. That's awesome. Um, so let's transition to the final questions. Yeah. Um, so do you have any resource of information that you like in particular? Yeah. Um, well, there are a lot of them. I use different resources for different um different aspects of clinical practice. You know, um, I'm doing um, PubMed searches every week or two as I have questions that I need. And I use, you know, all of the typical physical therapy journals, but it, it helps to look beyond physical therapy as well when you work in pediatrics. And so I like to look through um, medical journals and um, psychology journals for the cognitive aspect and the motivational aspect education journals and other disciplines journals like um, occupational therapy and speech language pathology journals as my resources. So I try to incorporate multiple sources. And I also have different mentors for different aspects of practice. As far as research in physical therapy in pediatrics, there, you know, the research is much harder because you're never going to see the exact patient population that you're working with because there's so much variety, but also because it's very hard to do research in pediatrics. Subject recruitment is really hard because you're not recruiting the patient, you're recruiting the patient's parents to agree for participation. I mean, listen, the COVID vaccine ha has just been submitted for FDA approval, right? This is very current. And they're talking about how they're going to hand it out. And people are saying, well, children should get it first but it hasn't even been tested on children. It's not going to get FDA approval for use in children because of course we test things on adults first because children are a protected population. 
So it's much harder. When I was doing research in pediatrics, it was so, it's why I stopped. It was so hard to recruit the subjects. And so it gets much, much harder. Um, but some of the best research that's coming out now in pediatric physical therapy is coming out of Iona Novak. She's an occupational therapist in um, Australia who runs a program um, for um, doing research in cerebral palsy that is, um, oh, I'm looking for the name of the program. Um, she does uh, Cerebral Palsy Alliance Research Foundation and it's um, cerebralpalsy.org, um, .au. And they do a lot of research in cerebral palsy, specifically into effective treatments. Um, and, and one of the things that she says that I found, you know, it just really spoke to the heart of it is that in children with cerebral palsy, often they'll receive physical therapy through an early intervention program. And it's called early intervention because it provides treatment services to children who are under three years old. But the diagnosis of cerebral palsy is often not even given to a child until they're a year old or older because the diagnosis involves acknowledging that the lesion is non-progressive. So it takes more than one examination to diagnose cerebral palsy. But you would never not treat a stroke survivor for the first year after their injury. They get their therapy immediately after injury. So incorporating treatment earlier, actually um, what Dr. Novak has found is that it actually decreases the incidence and severity of cerebral palsy. So what they're doing in Australia is they're diagnosing cerebral palsy through MRI of the brain rather, through, rather than through a motor examination, which is what's still being done primarily in the United States. So by diagnosing earlier, they receive treatment earlier. And that is super exciting to me. The other researcher who I just adore and anything you can get your hands on that she's published or any of her talks that she's given that you can find on YouTube is Karen Adolph. Um, she studies motor behavior and motor skill acquisition in children, but she's not a physical therapist. She's, I believe, a psychologist, um, but she's a motor behavior researcher and she looks at motor skill acquisition in young children. And she is just spot on. Anything you can get your hands on, I would recommend that you read or view. Great. Good resources of information. So I'm going to make sure to put on the show notes so people can take a look later. And what advice would you give to clinicians that are starting their careers? Oh, so I started out my career in pediatrics. And man, I wish I had taken a general position first. Um, you know, I started in the school system and I did it because of uh, the scholarship that I had. Um, and it was hard to get mentorship, but also learning medicine is hard when you're not in a medical environment. And so I actually wish I had had those first few years in a hospital setting going through multiple rotations so that I could learn about multiple medical conditions. So if I had a do-over, that would, that would probably be it. Um, and the other thing is starting your continuing education immediately, finding the mentors, going to courses, whether they're in-person courses or online courses. I personally love hands-on lab courses. I'm, I'm jonesing for them um, since COVID shut down. But, you know, finding really good continuing education courses and switching it up, not just finding one area of, of pediatric practice that you try to specialize in immediately or one approach to treatment. For example, when I graduated from PT school, all we had in pediatrics was NDT or Bobath treatment, neurodevelopmental treatment. Well, that was all we had. So that was what people studied. And they would go to an eight-week pediatric training course to get certified in NDT. It's too focused. And it's definitely too focused for early in your career. So rather than choosing a treatment approach and, and marrying that, studying many different areas of practice and learning to incorporate them in an eclectic way in your treatment, having multiple mentors and multiple sources of information and guidance. Fantastic. 
Um, last question. What qualities or abilities that you think are important to become a successful physical therapist? Curiosity. You have to be curious enough and intellectually curious enough to always want to improve on your knowledge base and your skills. So, you know, if your job becomes boring, you you sort of miss the boat. So being intellectually curious and, and constantly pursuing new knowledge and new information and new ways of doing things is going to make you a better clinician and is also going to make you engaged in what you're doing and, and sort of always thinking about what you're doing while you're doing it, having a plan, reassessing that plan, figuring out how to make it the best plan that it can possibly be. So you can keep it motivated, right? And always keep the interest going. Awesome. So Nehama, if anyone wants to contact you or find more information about you, how can they do that? So my email address is very simple. It's nahama at lightgate.com. And I can put that into the chat window now so that you can copy it and put it into the show notes. And I wanted to thank you so much for taking the time to uh, talk to me and uh, my first guest talking about PEDS. So that's exciting. Uh, so we can give our listeners a, a broad view about the different areas. And I think PEDS, it's a, a area that not many PTs, I believe, are working and we don't hear much about it. So that's my my mission, my idea, just to bring more and more knowledge. So thank you so much for sharing all your expertise. I really appreciate it. Uh, it's been my pleasure.